I am Laurel. And I'm Riley, and this is Tall Grass After Dark. Hello. So we're talking about uh, estate uh, taxes. Hmm. So or so you mentioned the word tax efficiency. Yeah. And I think I, I have an impression that there are some people that simply use these mechanisms to avoid so they can keep their wealth within this estate perpetually, so to speak, and never have to pay taxes on it and uh, continually pass that down. Uh, and and so when you think of through taxes and what they're for, I mean, you're almost robbing the people that you are in community with in America from getting to ha- have their their part in that. that. That's an argument. That is an argument. And what I think is convincing. I, I think there are... A lot of people, too, though, who see tax revenue being used not to support very many people, especially at the federal level, but instead being used to perpetuate endless foreign wars. Understandable. Um, yeah. You know, military industrial complex kind of stuff. Right. So a, a massive part of our federal budget is going toward things that most people are liberal or conservative, just uncomfortable funding. And I would also like to jump in and talk about something we were talking about when we were not filming earlier about. um, So the estate tax exemption right now is eleven point seven million dollars for an individual or twenty three point four million dollars for a married couple. And what's that tax? Uh, So what that means is that anything above that amount of money, if you own that when you die, um, is going to be taxed at 40 percent. Or, or thereabouts. It's a little less than that. but Not just, the first 11.7 or 23.4, but everything over that. Right. Amount. Biden is currently talking um, about his, the tax plan that he has put forward, that he is interested in, um, would do $3.5 million for an individual or $7 million for a married couple. Those are the numbers that it was at in 2009. So it'd be rolling it back 12 years is and what so, his proposal is. And so when people are hearing about a death tax or a state tax and they're like, uh, um, yeah. You know, the numbers that we're talking about are not numbers that most of us are going to be encountering, um, truthfully. And, and, and so beyond that, when we're talking about revocable living trust, we are not really talking about avoiding significant taxes. What we are truthfully talking about um, is avoiding probate uh, and then getting assets to the people that you care about more quickly and maybe in a way that's going to protect them from spending it in a way that you would be opposed to. And. And for a lot of folks, the phrase tax efficiency, when we're talking about revocable trusts, shows up more in a scenario like this. Okay, so this is actually from a client earlier today. Um, Young couple, no children, never going to have children, uh, can't biologically and don't intend to foster or adopt. They want a significant portion of their assets to go to charity when they pass away. And like most young people, they are saving aggressively in tax deferred retirement accounts like IRA 401k. So those are tax uh, or those are those are dollars they've made that they have not paid taxes on because they have put them into qualified retirement plans. If that money is what gets used to fund the charitable distributions when they die, then the charity also doesn't pay taxes on that because it's a it's a tax you know exempt organization. So that's a way to maximize transferring dollar for dollar, dollars earned to dollars given to charity at death, and that's efficient tax planning. But for them, um, their estate was never going to be taxed anyway. That's just going to be allowing them to maximize the amount of money they actually give to charity versus to individuals who would have to pay income taxes on it and decrease the size of that gift. Um, and then what what we were talking about earlier, um, I have a, a couple of clients and they are professionals. They are very well compensated for what they do. And they are individuals who um, they are not opposed really to being taxed in a pretty aggressive way upon their passing. You know, they have adult children. Those children have been taken care, care of. Um, they've gotten through their education. Uh, they've gotten their first home. And those are the things that the parents really wanted to make sure was possible. And now they have, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so as I was kind of counseling them, they were like, well, you know, we don't really care about taxes. And, and I appreciate that. Um, and we can absolutely plan in a way that doesn't protect anything from taxes. 
Um, but what I kind of wanted to share with them is I, I hear that you don't really care about being taxed, but I also hear that you really, really care about certain charities and you want to make sure that those charities have the resources they need to do the good work that you wish you could be more a part of. And I just want to share with you that, you know, estate planning can make sure that the things that are particularly important to you, which was like the Tulsa Food Bank, for example, have the most resources possible to be able to do that. And I would I would suggest that um, just generically allowing the government to tax your money is maybe not going to give you as targeted an approach at, at the causes that are most important to you. And even I mean. So, you know, there's this criticism you, you brought up um, about individuals or, or entities that want to decrease the amount of taxes they owe as if that's somehow maybe shirking a responsibility or, or not giving enough to their community. Um, and while I think that is an interesting criticism, I have yet to meet anyone, even the most kind of liberal social democrat young voter, who whenever they file their taxes every year, they don't take, you know, they don't give up their standard deduction or the child, you know, tax credit. Or if there are credits available to them for the mileage they use for their cars, et cetera, they take it. You know, people aren't, people are not lining up to offer more of their income to the government in taxes. Everybody is looking at how much do I actually have to pay versus, um, what I have. Yeah. For, I, mean, I, I do think example, it's complicated. There yeah. was a really significant donation um, to the Oasis grocery store, actually, um, which, you know, I think m most of our listeners would know what that is. Um, and if you wanted, you know, you could make sure that that was a direction that your assets were used in, right? Um, the other thing I want to say is that, uh, you know, when you're doing really good estate planning, it should capture your values no matter what amount of assets you have. Maybe you have a bunch, and so you want to direct it to a lot of different places um, or a whole bunch to this one specific place. But maybe you have this amount of assets. Maybe you have a $15,000 piece of real estate, and you and your spouse worked your whole lives to have that piece of property. You own it free and clear, and you want to pass it down. You are going to be able to do that without the, your heirs, your descendants, whoever you want it to be, paying any additional monies if you do efficient state planning, period. And can make sure that when it gets to them, their own financial bad luck, like a divorce or a lawsuit, et cetera, are not exposing that to some kind of an immediate loss. Yeah. Right. So our, what we feel is that our job as estate planning attorneys is to educate the community as much as we possibly can. Like, hey, listen, you have an estate you have stuff and you have values and we want to make your stuff play by your values. And it truthfully does not matter how how much or how little you might have. It matters. Estate planning matters for you. And we want to help fit whatever your goals are with estate planning and make that happen. Everybody has an estate. Everybody needs a plan and everybody's plan should incorporate and clearly communicate their individual unique values. Yes. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So let's switch gears, and this is probably a, and just talk at maybe a level where, you know, individual state attorney, state planning attorneys can't make a lot of impact as far as mm -hmm. the laws. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just want to kind of kick around the conversation, and this would be more of theoretical and, and where you land on philosophy, those kind of things. But there's a sense in which even charities mm -hmm. uh, are can be used. Uh, by the government uh, to shirk their responsibility for providing those uh, fundamental safety net for the people that are a part of the, the that that is within the care of mm -hmm. that government, mm -hmm. that, sure. that who they govern. And so then the charities uh, become then mechanisms for uh, keeping money in certain places uh but then also the, this kind of responsibility that they have to shoulder uh, for services. Uh, and, and when you think through, okay, but what's, you know, if, and again, this goes back to political philosophy and where you want to be and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. But if, if you're a government for the people to protect the people, to keep people uh, in, a, in a position where they can pursue 
happiness and freedom mm -hmm. that that ought to be kind of on you to provide those services uh, to ensure people are, are safe. And, and so you then being the government, you, the government as the, so as, and, and then the participation of the people, right? So we participate in, we participate through tax to provide a safety net for our neighbors. And I know that's not the way it necessarily is set up. We, we put that off on charities, but I think that that can become a sort of a philosophical point that does lead to sort of, you, you mentioned the, you know, mi the military industry, but the nonprofit industrial complex that continues to, to cause harm in ways that concentrates money in like, uh, funds uh and and the i so on an individual philosophical level i think the difference between sort of nonprofit versus um government collection of resources and distribution of resources is not that one is more likely than the other to do harm they can both do harm there are charities doing amazing work and there are charities doing harm there are government programs that are doing amazing work and government programs that are doing harm. The, the fundamental moral difference in my mind is that participation in providing resources for the government is coerced and enforced through violence. You have to give this, and if you don't, you're going to jail. The participation in giving nonprofits resources to distribute and allocate them is voluntary, um, and it is not enforced through violence. Uh, and I think, I think how the money gets to one versus the other is just as important as what is likely to be done with it once it's there. Um, and while I do wish the government was uh, more true to its ideals and, and being representational and using resources for the betterment of communities, I think that's rare that it actually happens in practice. Um, and because... It's rare that it happens in practice and uh, allocation of resources is coercive and enforced through violence. Um, I tend to, my own moral philosophical stance is sort of government averse at the moment. I would love it if things could change and I could change that philosophy, but I mean, based on what's happening on the ground, that's my own stance. And, and I would say that I think, you know, your point is, is a valid criticism, um, but you know, personally, I, I come from a point of view that like what you said should be addressed through political activism yeah, for sure. and perhaps, um, you know, organizing, advocating, um, lifting up politicians that we think are going to do a better job of representing our actual interests, whatever those might be. Mm -hmm. Um, and that my function as an estate planning attorney is to simply advise you on what your possibilities are. Yeah, and that, yeah, certainly. Yeah. And why I wanted to make clear that this is not a, this wasn't a problem that you all could necessarily yeah. impact yeah. directly as a state planning I attorney. I wish. I would love right. to just wave that magic wand. Um, and of course, Tallgrass does have a an ethos of social justice and yeah. activism. Uh, in your own ways as, as two individuals mm -hmm. who are married and have this company, but uh, you do it differently in your expressions, mm -hmm. but, but still the, the fundamental yeah. values of tall grass as a state attorney's office mm -hmm. is we, we are neighbors. Yeah. And you know, so talk about that a little bit and how that does come through your, you know, directly in your practice. I mean, you've kind of talked about it, but maybe give an example of, of why, it does, it does touch things like racism and classism and those sort of uh, you know, problems that... LGBTQIA, yeah, the, equality right. issues, yeah. yeah. Um, so we had, and I'll just reference this in case anyone also wants to look it up because it'll be a, probably a longer uh, discussion than what we're able to do here, but we were interviewed on the Pod for Good podcast. Um, Shout out. Shout out. We love Pod for Good. We love Jesse. We're sponsors of Pod for Good. We think they do great work. Oh, cool. I've never heard of them. I know, right? Yeah. Surprise. Um, but uh, our, our conversation there was about how estate planning um, is, is one of the ways that we can help confront 
systemic racism. So as an example, I'll kind of bring this up a little bit and then let Laurel talk about it because she worked on this case directly. The, the big idea is this. Um, if you do the right kind of planning, then you can take whatever assets you have, could be a lot, could be a little, and transfer them privately and efficiently without costs for courts, attorneys, government, etc., cetera, um, to the next generation, debt-free and with asset protection so that the next generation can pick that up and use ownership of property to, um, to gain more influence, to have collateral, to be financially independent, to not be relying on high interest loans, that kind of a thing to sort of make it through life. And, um, and I will just say, like, surprise, it is mostly white people who are relying on estate planning for those many benefits that Riley just enumerated. Right. So those those benefits are available to everybody. But again, practically, what do we see happening? What we see happening is of the 40 percent of Americans that are doing estate planning, they are disproportionately white and wealthy. Um, so white, wealthy folks generationally have got a leg up on marginalized communities or other racial ethnic groups that aren't doing this kind of planning because at the death of each generation, assets are either being lost because the next generation can't afford to pull them through to the next generation or, or being exposed to uh, court costs, attorney's fees, et cetera, associated with probates. Um, and then what happens is over the course of just two or three generations, the difference that efficient transfer of property, even little amounts of property, has made, gives one generation a significant leg up on the others. So um, to the degree that systemic racism is not really a product of anybody's intentions, but just how the wheels turn, um, the disproportionate number of white folks doing estate planning versus black and brown and, and, and indigenous folks doing estate planning is one of the ways that systemic racism shows up. So if we can if we can help inform more um, black, indigenous, people of color communities to get in and do this kind of planning, then we can be that much closer to creating a kind of equality that otherwise doesn't exist. Right. What that might look like more specifically is a particular case we worked on that Laurel might want to flesh out. But Yeah, I mean, I hate to have anybody just have their eyes glaze over, but... Um, <laughs> Because it, it did get a kind but of this is I mean this is detail specific and I think important. because it can get really detail specific people, people just check kind of out. check out and yeah. like I don't care but okay you don't care until it costs you like ten thousand dollars that's when you care right <laughs> um, and so I would encourage people to care before that fact or you have entire neighborhoods in your city that are run down and crime ridden etc um, because of these kinds of systemic inequalities right. We, uh, we had a client approach us. It was actually a business. Um, the business was approaching us to do a quiet title action because they had been approached by somebody who was an heir uh, that theoretically could own land um, that abutted this company's land that they already owned. Um, the land at issue was worth originally like $5,000. So a pretty small amount of money based on where it was and the size of the piece of land. But there was a, a structure on the building or on the land. Um, somebody had been living within it and that person had passed and the family had kind of all pitched in over many years. But, um, now it, it was just kind of owned by, I think like six different people. Right. Uh, and so the company wasn't really sure where all of them were. Luna really wants that stick. Um, and the 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 family had approached the company because they were hoping maybe the company would be willing to buy the piece of property to pay for the funeral of the mm. person who had been living in the structure. Right. The family just didn't really have enough money to pull together to pay for the funeral. OK. Well, as I began researching the chain of title to be able to do this quiet title action, um, two people had originally owned it. Uh, and then at some point, um, those two people apparently had passed because a partition action had been filed. And when I read the petition, it was by the uh, half 
daughter and then daughter of the person who originally owned the property and your eyes are starting to glaze mm. over but what that means is that it was owned one quarter by one person and three quarters by the other person and what does that mean that means if those two stepsisters are fighting we cannot sell the property without court action what does court action mean it means attorneys what does attorneys mean money. it means money yeah and so those two people uh, at the very, they also had to pay appraisers because the, the two sisters could not agree um, how much the property should be valued at, right? So they had to go pay other people who weren't related to them, three different people to come to a decision on how much the property was worth. Okay, so you've got, I think that was, that was in the court records and that was about $1,500, right? Not to mention what the attorneys were already paid. The appraisers came back and they said that the piece of property was worth about $5,000. Okay, so by the end of that, you know, what the original people who owned the property had like saved and worked for and thought they were passing on a legacy to their children, to their descendants, ended up actually being a great big fat legal bill because the two of them couldn't agree. And if they had done some simple planning, they could have vested that legal title into one person, right? Um, to be able to sell it, to be able to do whatever thing with it. But uh, instead, what happened is there was that partition. Those, those women, uh, the two sisters, were paying the attorneys as well as the appraisers. And then the company came and was paying me to do a quiet title action because, once again, six people owned it. Hmm. Right. Um, and so that's because one of those, another generation passed without any planning, without doing right. any planning. And so that's one of those times where if you know that estate planning matters, if you know how to do it, then you can pass generational wealth more effectively. And it doesn't matter once again, if it's a lot or if it's a little. And I would I would argue that when it is not as much monetarily, it's not as big a, a you know, millions, billions of dollars. You know, um, Bezos could give a, a million dollars away and not notice. Mm -hmm. Whereas a person who has $20,000 giving 5,000 away really, really matters. And that impacts everyone. And, and I, I think listening to it, it's important to acknowledge that there is a real benefit to people already in possession and have access to this type of planning to not share that knowledge. Right. Right. I mean, if we're just being honest, mm -hmm. because these little situations compound. I get a property here. I get a property here. Right. Uh, they and it's easy to say they should have just they should have been prepared. Mm -hmm. They should have been doing planning. I'm not saying that's what you were doing, but it's easy for people to have access to that kind of knowledge to to not only pass on wealth, but to accumulate wealth by keeping people in the dark about how they can protect their assets. Sure. And, and I'm and that's again. I'm saying tall grass is not about that. No. Want people to have access to that knowledge in a way that works for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was also thinking too about this wasn't, so the Tulsa race massacre and the, the wealth lost there was oh. not due to a lack of planning. Right. Obviously it was due to murderous, riotous, uh, white Tulsans who decided, you know, they were better than uh, another group of people and right. got pissed off about it and decided to, to, to burn a neighborhood down. Right. But it does show how what a what could be a failure to plan on somebody's part could do for a general life. So right. It's, it's not so much that like the current situation is entirely due to a previous generation's failure to plan. There's of course all kinds of reasons outside of estate right. planning that create inequalities. This is just one of several ways to address it. And kind of a positive version of, of the, the narrative Laurel was walking through is we had a client, an elderly lady, um, who owned a house worth about $35,000, but she owned it entirely. It was paid for. She, she really wanted to make sure that if she died, her granddaughter, who was a full-time student, could own that house and have property. And she had known enough because of what a neighbor went through that she didn't want to go through probate. But she also knew that she didn't need to create something like a trust, et cetera, for what her particular concerns were. We were able to draft a really simple tool called a transfer on death deed that when she died, and she did die last year, when she died, that property automatically belonged to her niece 
or pardon me, her granddaughter. Did you have to file an acceptance? Yeah. So she was able to do that. Legal disclaimer, sir. Um, but essentially what happened is that granddaughter um, would never have been able to afford the probate to pay for grandma's $35,000 house. And that would have been property that sat vacant in that neighborhood until there was some kind of a sheriff sale. Um, who knows what would have happened to it. Um, but in this particular case, what happened is uh, granddaughter avoided probate uh, at 22 years old, became the owner of real estate outright. That is a powerful way to make sure that she has um, a place to stay or if she rented it out to have a source of income or if she needed to use as collateral to start building her credit. Um, her leg up because of that simple move on grandma's part is going to make an extraordinary difference on the trajectory of her life. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, it just, it makes a massive difference. And, and the idea that some people don't have enough quote unquote to do an estate plan is just wrong. It frustrates me. We sometimes hear financial advisors, um, and, and they're used to dealing with clients who have millions and millions of dollars and that's great. And we love planning with them too. Um, but they, the financial advisors will suggest that somebody who has less than X amount of dollars, oh, well, they don't really need a trust. And I don't quite understand what that means. Like, I, I don't think that what they really mean is, well, their values and their hopes for their assets, don't for their family don't matter as compared to people who have hit this threshold. I don't think they mean that. But I don't know what else they do mean. Exactly. I think what they... You know, trying to give them the benefit of the doubt, them here being anybody who says that, not just a financial advisor. But I think what they're thinking is, you know, your initial question in this conversation is was about essentially who gets stuff when I die. Um, if that's the only problem you're trying to solve, then, yeah, there's a lot of people that don't need to trust. There's simpler ways to determine that. Right. Um, what a trust can do, especially the way we try to draft them, is a lot more than just avoid a probate, but make sure that that asset is protected from other kinds of financial liabilities or for a special needs individual, et cetera. So that if you've got a lady who's uh, you know, a single mom with a $100,000 home and she's got small children and wants to make sure that if she dies, those children not only have that house, but it's not exposed to a default on a student loan or if the children develop a special need, it doesn't mean they lose their benefits then that person's need for a trust is just as valid as the millionaires who wants to avoid estate taxes. It's just going to work differently and be structured a little differently. So I think that most of the people that are saying you don't need a trust have got this popular misconception that it's just about who gets your stuff when you die. And when you start to fill in the blanks and say, but they care about this and they care about that and they're afraid of this. Mm -hmm. And don't you think a trust is a good way to address those problems? They go, oh, well, of course. Yeah, that makes sense. So I just think it's even a lack of education about kind of values-based planning yeah. on even financial professionals part. You can't assume that everybody that's a CFP or a, an insurance broker understands how this works. Often they don't. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of questions I want to ask, but I think we've got it's probably enough. <laughs> we got we plenty of stop, episodes to come. Right. We'll, ask, we'll ask a lot more. Thank you all for watching Tallgrass After Dark. If you don't, don't want to stare at our ugly faces, you can find the audio version anywhere podcasts can be found. But if you do enjoy staring at our beautiful faces, please subscribe to the Tallgrass Estate Planning YouTube channel so you do not miss the next Tallgrass After Dark. Beautiful. Hmm? Say goodbye to this camera. Goodbye. We love you. And hand it down, no. whether it was a lot or not. No. I see that you feel strongly, but my answer is still no. No. Well, our communities, the type of access other people have to, to become attorneys and let them go back to their communities and serve them. Yeah, and so that's part of really what we do is we have several people that we mentor with that specific goal. Yeah they can return to their communities and have this really high level knowledge and bring it to people who need it and in a way that they can hear trust and act on. and then they would understand it in a way that you can't right. or i right. couldn't right and translate it in a way that you and i couldn't right go down
No. And thank you all for watching Tallgrass After Dark. If you want to stare at our ugly faces, you can find the audio version anywhere podcasts can be found. But if you do enjoy staring at our faces, please subscribe to the Tallgrass Estate Planning YouTube channel so you don't miss the next Tallgrass After Dark. I am not going to be able to remember all of that. You but read I that like while I drum. Yeah, listen, I was recording that, so I might just use that. So okay. Go check out that Jesse guy that they mentioned in the episode. Oh, yeah, yeah, Jesse. Oh, no, all, He's so cool. cool. Yeah, the Alfred website. So Alfred so. Good. Yeah, you're welcome. That's so why I should, I, I should have one camera just like facing me, so I can click that one. Be like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay, what else do you want? You want me to do it again? Sure. Okay.